you got to destroy negative thoughts, negative thoughts, negative ideologies, fearful ideologies. It's called stinking thinking. According to the theological workbook of the Old Testament, the word think comes from the root word which means gate. You know what a gate is? It's to split open or to break through one realm to another. Your thoughts are your gatekeepers. Tonight I'm going to preach a message to you that I believe is going to change your life entitled Combat in the Heavenly Realm. Combat in the Heavenly Realm. Amen. I'm so happy to be here for this Friday night. Hot temperatures have come upon us. But uh, I know I said it earlier. I want to say it again. Man, it just thrilled my heart to see the parking lot full tonight on Friday night and even parking in the overflow. Isn't that awesome? I see that on Sunday, but I like having that on Friday. Amen. In the overflow. We want to live constantly in the overflow in every way. Hallelujah. Glad to see Brother Isaac back from vacation. Brother Edward, we're glad you're here tonight. And anybody that's uh, been out, uh, we're glad that you're back. Uh, the Myers, I know that they're back as well, and I'm thankful for that. A lot of people last, last weekend, a lot of folks were out. Uh, this is the traveling season. But uh, nevertheless, uh, I would ask you to stand tonight. And let's get into the word of the Lord. I have a message that I believe if you'll listen will change your life tonight. It will change how you see everything. Ephesians chapter 6. If you've ever wondered why your prayers didn't get answered, you're going to understand why tonight. If you've ever wondered why you've battled with a spirit of oppression, you're going to understand why tonight. Amen. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. He didn't say we didn't wrestle. You are in a fight. Just not against flesh and blood. He didn't say we weren't in a fight. Just not against flesh and blood. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but here's what we wrestle against. But against principalities, that is, demonic forces ruling over a region, strongholds. You know, certain areas are known for certain stronger sins. Some areas have more sin and a, predomin a predominant sin in that particular area. That's a principality against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Next verse. Wherefore take unto you the whole, not just part of it, the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. My message tonight, delivering to this grand, beautiful audience, beautiful crowd here tonight, great group of people. I love you all. The title is The Combat in the Heavenly Realm. Combat in the Heavenly Realm. You may be seated tonight. Amen. I recently heard the testimony of an evangelist who didn't always used to be an evangelist, who at one time served the devil in the occult world. And I listened to this man give his testimony, and he begins to tell the group, what happens in the spiritual realm when Christians pray? This man that I heard this testimony from, an evangelist now, was born. And when he was born, his parents 
which were witches, dedicated him to Lucifer at his birth. His parents performed many rituals of the occult, sacrifices and bloodshed before he was even born, so that when he was born into the world, he would have power, power, demonic power in the supernatural realm. By the time he was four years old, his parents gave him up because they were afraid of him. He had become so evil and had become so powerful that he even surpassed the witches, the modern witches that just dabble in witchcraft. Um, he had learned to perform terrible things. He had gotten so powerful in the spirit realm that he could actually levitate above the ground and go outside his body, go into trances and come in, come in and out of his body and actually leave his body behind. Also known as astral travel, astral projection if you've ever heard of it. He was used as he grew older and become an adult I listened to him tell this testimony and he, would, he wept and cried at some of the things that he had done to gain power, bloodshed, and acts of immorality that you have to perform to gain demonic power. And uh, as he got older and he began to work with a larger covenant group of corporate witches, he... His very purpose was they would have shift work and they would work together and they would, astral projection, leave their body and go and attack different churches and attack and try to infiltrate different ministries and attack pastors and, and their family and, and saints in the church. That was his very job. He was assigned to destroy... Christians, and some of you need to listen to this tonight. Please, let's avoid the, 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 the bathroom trips and the wandering around. Some of you need to hear the word of the Lord tonight. He was assigned one day to attack and destroy a church, but this church knew how to pray. Even though this church had many problems and they even had many divisions in the church, the pastor called for a fast. And in this fast, the members began to pray and go on an extended time of fasting. And they got to the place to where they entered into a time of great repentance uh, and reconciliation with one another and divisions between church members and bitternesses and hurts were put aside and unforgiveness was dealt with and the body was reunified and strengthened and they were praying together and and they put down their emotional walls from 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 coming together and accepting one another and 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 becoming a part of one another and this man came in a form of astral projection against this church multiple times this is the story he told okay this is his story and uh and as he would attack this church he said that there was a, when this church began to pray and fast, that there, began this, there was this barrier over the roof of the church. And as he would leave his body, he would come down over that church and he would try to penetrate that barrier, but he couldn't break through because there was a protection over them that stopped him from being able to make his advances. This church had begun to pray and fast and they had asked God for mercy and sought after God. And this man came again and again against the church. But one night in the altar call, there was such a move of the Spirit of God that there was a word of prophecy that came to the pastor. And he said to them, Rise up in spiritual warfare. The yoke is about to be broken. He said it again and again and again. And as he attacked, there was a covering of protection over the church and the spirit realm. 
And this man that was hovering over the church trying to get through to disrupt the meeting and, and, and distract the people and, and bring division in the church, he got really frustrated when six angels, he said, arrested him, literally. Arrested him. And they brought him through the roof of the church onto the floor and held him to the floor. And the pastor spoke up again. The yoke has been broken. And the Spirit of God spoke to the pastor and he said, The victim is before you. Somehow, some way, this man's body caught up with his spirit in the church house. And as they began to pray, the demons spoke out of him and didn't want to leave. And they had found this man to be a stronghold in that community. But as the church prayed and they called on the name of Jesus, he was delivered completely and fully set free. And today he is a spirit-filled evangelist preaching the gospel and telling his story to help others find true deliverance. If there is a particular ministry that is missing in the church today, it is the ministry of genuine deliverance. When people get into the church and they join the church and get born again, but they're still struggling with the same hang-ups, the same hurts, and the same habits a year later, they need to come under the power and the anoint, a breaker anointing, a, a breakthrough anointing, a, an anointing that breaks the yoke, an anointing that brings deliverance. Amen. And so today he is being used by God to help set others free by deliverance. Now, when I heard this, I even almost initially, to be honest with you, struggled to believe this. As he shared his testimony, I watched him weep over the things that he did to gain power in the occult world. The more evil acts you perform, the more power you are entrusted. Even acts of rape and murder are done to gain spiritual power. He shared how he would lead expositions into the air. He would work with other witches. And there were even set times that they would wage war in the spirit as they would go into their trances, in their seances, and on their altars. And what he said I found so appealing, and as I prayed, the Holy Spirit began to show me His words were true. So tonight I preach to you and share with you His testimony. Then I'm going to share with you some Scripture. But I'm going to share His testimony to you because the Holy Spirit has showed me that He is 100% accurate in His testimony. He told His experience as an agent of the occult. What He saw when he would go out in these expositions to attack and bring attack upon the people of God and bring attack upon saints and upon their families and their children and their marriages and their ministries and their church. Here's what he said. He said, as we would leave our bodies and, 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 and astral projection, he said, what a lot of people don't know is there is a spiritual blanket over every place on this earth. He said it is a spiritual blanket, Brother Hoyer, of oppression. It is a blanket of oppression. It's like, Brother Blanton, like a thick blanket, if you please. He described it as a dome. A dome over the heavens. And above, they could go above that dome or below that dome. They could go above that rock barrier or below the barrier. Those spirits can go above this blanket, this dome, as well as below it. And from that level, they attempt to influence the events on the earth. 
When the evil spirits align with these evil satanic occult agents, they do what they call their shift work, okay? And they go out and attack churches and saints and ministries and homes and marriages. They go to places, listen to this now, they go to places of covenant, such as lakes and waterways and streams, to refresh themselves spiritually and gain strength in the spirit realm. Like they're feeding themselves. They would refresh their spirits. And you know what caused? You know what fed them? What fed them was the sacrifices that people would put on the occult altar. Such as abortion. Because of that terrible act, because blood was shed in an evil manner, because that act was happening in cities abroad, they actually fed off of that terrible act. It strengthened them because those behaviors were being performed in the earth. They gained strength by the sins of other people. Such things as animal sacrifices strengthened them. Sexual acts of perversion, homosexuality and immorality and incest and child molestation and things, such terrible things performed in the earth is what actually strengthened them to do their spiritual work. When people would cut themselves, if you've ever known of cutters, what they actually would do would feed off of the blood that people who are depressed or under satanic oppression. When they would cut themselves, the demons and these agents of the occult would actually, I'm not trying to be rated R here, they would suck up the blood. It fed them. Why? The Bible says that the life of all flesh is in the blood. And as you know, even in Scripture, in ancient practices of idolatry, one of the main things they would put on an altar was blood. Because it fed that deity or that demon that they were trying to worship or work with to help them in the earth. Any kind of sinful act that people did gave strength and power to these agents of the occult. And he said they are in every city upon the earth. Attacking churches, going into the spirit realm where you can't even see, attacking Christians, pivoting husband and wives against one another, attacking the minds of children in the homes under age of the saints, especially men and women who have children in the church but don't really have a prayer life. They just live from service to service. Their children become victims and attacked in their mind. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. So these sinful acts gave strength and power to these occultists. These satanic agents claim that when Christians begin to pray, they always see it manifest in one of three different ways. They said all prayer appears like smoke rising to the heavens. Now he's telling this what he saw when he worked in the occult and, and moved in astral projection out of body experiences to attack, stealthily attack people when they weren't the people of God. Churches bringing division, uh, whispering in the ears, gossip. And he said that all of this is brought on by satanic oppression. And he said some people's prayers... And he said this is common knowledge amongst those who practice the occult or in the deeper levels of it. Of course, there are just the people who play with it and dabble with it, and it's just fun and games. But there are some people who have really tapped into it by performing acts of bloodletting and bloodshed. And he said that some people's prayers, he described it, appeared like smoke. And it would drift up the air, it would drift up into the air. Their prayers would would like smoke go up into the air, but it would just dissipate and disappear. 
These are the Christians who have sin in their lives. He said, who had hardness in their heart, who didn't have a prayer life, who just prayed from time to time or when they got in trouble or were Sunday Christians. He said, these were the Christians who had things in their heart, bitternesses and grudges, that they were refusing to deal with and get under the blood. Their prayers would dissipate like smoke into the air. He said it would just blow away and disappear because they were secretly hiding something and they were not dealing with a private struggle and a private sin. And so their prayers would go up like smoke, but it would not penetrate through the dome and go into the heavenlies. It would just kind of dissipate and not go any further. He said then there were other people who prayed and their prayers also looked like smoke until it reached the dome rock over the earth uh, or the blanket over every city and region. But he said even though it would reach the dome, it didn't go through it because they lacked the faith that is needed to accompany somebody's prayer life. And when they do not approach God in confidence... He said when the ones who would pray but didn't really believe they'd get what they'd pray for and just really didn't have any faith or expectation or belief that what they asked, Jesus said, what's over you ask in my name? Believe that you shall receive whatsoever you ask. And he said these people... The second group, their prayers were like smoke and it would get to the dome, but because they didn't accompany their prayers with faith, it didn't go through the dome over the earth, this thick blanket, because they lacked the faith needed by somebody when they pray. He said the third type of prayer that he's seen was like smoke as well. But he said this kind, this third type of prayer became so hot that when the smoke would get to the dome that, that separates the heavenlies from the earth, that area that needs to be penetrated for you to get a breakthrough. He said that what he would see in the Spirit, in his testimony, is that this third type of prayers would become so hot, the smoke would become so hot that it would begin to pound against the dome rock until it became so hot that the dome rock began to start to melt like wax. And it would begin to pierce the rock and eventually, as they kept praying in faith with a clean life, it would pierce through the dome rock. He said many times when people begin to pray, it's like the first time, the first one, like the first group. In other words, their prayers just like smoke dissipates. He said, but as people learn how to pray, and as they learn how to daily, daily seek the face of God earnestly, the effectual prayer of a righteous man avails much. He said as they begin to learn how to pray, that eventually their, their prayers would become like the third kind and it would become so hot like fire that they would break through. The evil agents would notice when the smoke would begin to change forms and it would start to get hot, the evil agents would begin to communicate with each other when they seen the prayer starting to break through. They would begin to communicate with each other in the spirit realm and say to the, each other, Go and distract that person. They're getting close. And so a cell phone would ring. And they would stop that intercessory prayer. And Should I answer it? Or somebody would holler for them. Or they would hear their text message notification sound. And he said that that was what they would do. They would work together to go distract that person because they're getting close to piercing the dome. 
And he said, sadly, many Christians, when they are repenting and pressing through and learning to pray, because I don't know what it is about prayer. It's like church attendance. The more you do it, the more you want to do it. It's like reading the Bible. It's like any spiritual thing you do. Reading the Word, praying every day. The more you do it, the more you want to do it. But the less you do it, the less you want to do it. The less you go to church, the less you want to go. But the more you go, the more you want to go. And the more you pray, the more you want to pray. And the more you read the Word and, and hear great preaching that builds your faith, the more you want to hear more great preaching that builds your faith. But the less you hear, and the less you read, and the less you pray, the less you want to read and pray. I've heard that somewhere before. And that's what he said. He said, he convinces the Spirit will convince the Christian who's about to press through to take heed to the distraction, whatever it is. And sadly, the Christian would answer their phone or whatever, and then go back to praying. But the problem is, the trick is, once they left that realm and answered the phone, they had to start all over and go back to the beginning. He said they would do anything. They would Hunger pains would come over the person praying. Or they would feel a pain in their body and their knees would begin to hurt so they'd get up off their knees and lose focus. The biggest threat that this former occult agent said, he said the biggest threat to the power of darkness was when pastors would begin to teach their spirit-filled congregations on how to pray. He said if they could keep Christians disinterested in prayer, they could maintain strongholds in their churches, in their homes, and communities. <laughs> but said the biggest threat to the powers of hell and darkness was when pastors would teach their congregations how to pray and to get them to learn how to pray and to keep going and going and going and pressing and pressing and pressing until they touch the hem I mean until the smoke turns into fire and presses through the dome rock The agent said that the demons could not handle the heat of those hot prayers because the heat produced by them, they could not stand. And when the person got a breakthrough, here's what he said happens in the Spirit. In the Spirit, he said, they create an opening over the person. An open portal into the Spirit realm. They get an open heaven over their life. For heavens to actually pour out a blessing on them. He said so many blessings they knew that God wanted to bless and heal and answer His people. But until the people of God took the responsibility to pray to get a breakthrough, all His blessings would do was pour down the side of the dome. Oh, hallelujah. Now listen to this. He said when they would get that breakthrough, they would create an opening, a portal into the heavenly realm. And when they finally busted through, he said you'll know when you get a breakthrough when you pray because all of a sudden it's like you lose track of time. And you feel no resistance anymore. And the prayer becomes easy. Anybody ever been to that place? Where the praying becomes easy and it's just like it flows. It flows and you get a breakthrough and you lose track of time. And it's when people used to talk about waking up two or three hours later after being slain in the spirit, their face all snotted up and their hair all boogered up and didn't know where in the world they even were. Drunk in the spirit. That's the kind of breakthrough he said that when people would get, it would create an opening in that dome above the earth. He said a portal into the heavenly realm. But when they would bust through and there would be no resistance, that they would get that breakthrough. Now listen to what this former uh, agent of the occult said. He said the hole, once they get the breakthrough, stays open. And the hole will follow them wherever they go. He said... 
They always were threatened by people who got breakthroughs in the Spirit and he could recognize them because there was a light over them and he knew that that light was a symbol shining down on them. They had a hole over the opening of the heavens over them. Now get this. He said when they would be in the presence of other people who were oppressed or bound, that by being just in their very presence, the, the, the people around them, the bondages and struggles they had would begin to loosen. And chains will begin to loosen up around just by being around the person who had an open heaven, a hole in the dome over them. He said, just by, let me say it like this. The people who had a hole in, it's just like their very shadow, Peter, could heal the sick. Remember that? The Bible said Simon Peter had such a breakthrough that his very shadow healed the sick. But he said, the problem is, so many people stop before they get the breakthrough. He says that when the dome was pierced, it stays open and a pillar of fire literally comes down and abides with that person. And the presence comes upon that place wherever they go, they carry it with them. The bondages of people are weakened when they come in the presence of this person who has pierced the dome. He said the agents of the occult would mark the people who had broke through in prayer and had that light shining down on them. They knew they had pierced through the veil, the dome, the barrier. And he said that the agents of the occult would study these people and watch them carefully and closely. And here's what their strategy was. To dig up anything they could on these people. To put them in condemnation to get them to lose their breakthrough. And listen, he said what they would do is they would dig up what they could find on these people and would begin to communicate with the other occult spirits around them. This is their weakness. Tempt them with this. Distract her with this. Make this happen and they won't pray. Make this happen and they won't go to church for a month. All they had to do was just tamper with their circumstances that they knew would create a struggle in their life and they knew their weakness. They studied these people. They knew their weakness. And so all they had to do, if they wanted to get them to start to lose their breakthrough, they'd just get it, uh, 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 they would begin to just create the environment that, that, that accompanies their weakness and then they would fall. Now listen. My goodness. If they yielded to the temptation, he said each time they yielded to their weakness, the hole got smaller and smaller and smaller. The breakthrough over them. Each time they resisted the devil, the breakthrough hole over them got bigger. And bigger. He said, but when, when they would begin to give in and, 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 and give in to the temptation and their weakness, he said, all of a sudden the hole would eventually, each time they gave in, the hole would begin to close up more and more and more until finally the breach was repaired and they lost that special anointing, that breaker anointing. They're still Christians, they're still saved, but they've lost that extra power by giving in the enemy, by giving in again and again to the same old struggle in their mind. By giving in each time they gave in, it gave the enemy the right to cover up the hole a little bit more. I remember Jesus taught us to pray like this. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one. I think Jesus knew what He meant when He taught us to pray that way. Hallelujah. You see, when you get a breakthrough, you got to learn to hold on to that breakthrough. 
If your weakness is sexual sin, then Satan's going to create the environment that you will lose confidence in yourself and mess up. And then you'll condemn, you'll be in condemnation and you'll lose your breakthrough. If your weakness is to feel sorry for yourself or to fall into depression, oh, somebody hear me. If the enemy knew, he said if they, they were depressed, all they'd have to do is just cause some flare-up to happen at their job. Just something to trigger discouragement. <sighs> My goodness. Now get this though, here's what he said. He said, in all the years I did this, in every week... When I would go out in astral projection and go in the spirit in people's homes and in their churches and attack them. He said he knew that when somebody prayed, he never knew a case where the answer didn't come. He said one thing that Christians have the wrong perception of is he said he that many Christians think that when they pray, that God's not answering them. He said, that's not the case. He said, we could rise above the dome or below it. He said, every time they prayed in Jesus' name, he said, an answer started coming down from the heavens. But if they didn't have a hole in the dome, a breakthrough, they couldn't receive. Woo. he said but in most cases it didn't make it to the person praying so the person just thought God wouldn't hear them and God didn't answer prayer then they lost faith so they lost the desire to pray because they started to believe that God didn't even hear or answer their prayer anyways but he heard and he answered every time they just didn't have a breakthrough so the answer didn't come to them The answer didn't get to them. It came. Like Jesus promised, whatsoever you ask, in my name I will do it. Did he not say that? Is he a liar? Then why doesn't it come? He said the reason why it came didn't come is because of the spiritual conditions of the heaven over their particular life. If the whole in the dome was closed off, the answer couldn't get to them because of a lack of breakthrough or because they lost the breakthrough. Now listen to this. This agent of the occult went on to say what a lot of Christians don't know is, is that every Christian has an angel assigned to them. And that's scriptural too because they, even the Jews believe this, by the way. They, you remember when, when the church, I think in Acts 12, was praying for Simon Peter's release from prison? Uh, and, and the Scripture says that they were praying for his release, and he got loose. The angel got him out of the prison. See, you're having a hard time believing what I'm telling you right now, but I'm telling you from the Bible, angels let Christians out of jail. I bind out in the name of Jesus. You see in here, let me just, there's a difference between doubt and unbelief. I said there's a difference between doubt and unbelief. Doubt is when you have enough evidence to believe. Or excuse me, doubt is when you don't have enough evidence to believe. You so see, you're not convinced. Unbelief is different. Unbelief is when you do have enough evidence to believe. You just choose not to. Doubt is when you don't have enough evidence to believe for it. Unbelief is when you do have enough evidence, you just choose not to believe for it. Now, remember when, when the angel came knock or when Peter came knocking at the door and the girl went to answer the door? They didn't even believe. I, I've always laughed at this. They couldn't believe that God would answer their prayer, but they believed it was his angel. 
If God can send an angel, why can't he get the man out of prison? I can see it right now. Oh, God, deliver our apostle Peter, please, Lord. Please get him out of prison. He's our leader. Somebody's at the door. Oh, God, we got faith in you if we ask in Jesus' name. Oh, you're going to come through and you're going to answer. Please let Simon Peter, oh, get him out of prison and bring him back to us, Lord. The girl's standing at the door. It's Simon Peter. Shut up. It's just his angel. Oh, God, please. But the interesting thing was is his angel looked just like him because he thought it was Peter. They thought it was Peter. Now, what does that mean? This former occultist said that when people pray, the answer comes in their angel's hands. Just like Daniel. Remember Daniel prayed and fasted? And what did the angel say? 21 days later, the answer finally came after fasting and prayer. And the angel told Daniel, I'd have got here quicker, but the prince of darkness withstood me. (laughs) That's what it says. So, the answer, your answered prayer, comes in the angel's hands, just like in Daniel. And like when Peter showed up, they thought it was his angel because the angel looked just like him. He said, if the person who prays, listen to this now. If the praying Christian has the armor of God on him, the helmet of salvation to protect his thoughts, the breastplate of righteousness to protect his heart or his emotions. If he has the sword, the word of God, to defend himself. Here's what he said. Now listen. He said, if the Christian praying had on the armor of God, then the angel that brought their answer has the same level of armor the Christian has on. But if the one who prays doesn't care about his spiritual armor, Christians who don't really care about what thoughts enter their mind. Christians who don't have on the helmet of salvation. (sighs) Who let the bird more than flutter, they let him build a nest there. Who let seeds of grudge and bitterness and jealousy, oh God have mercy. Or Christians who don't have on the breastplate of righteousness and their heart is wounded and their soul gets wounded and they're offended by everything and everybody and their feelings are constantly hurt. Here's what he said. He said, whatever level of armor the Christian had on is the same level of armor their angel had on. If they didn't have on the helmet of salvation, fear, lust, anger, depression, rebellion. If these thoughts were in their mind, they didn't have on the helmet of salvation, then guess what? The angel doesn't have on the helmet of salvation either. Anybody ever seen angels armed with armor? Michael in the Bible was armed with armor. Now listen to this. He said the angel only has on the armor that praying Christian that their Christian has. So the, their angel, when he tries to bring the Christian their answer, the prince of darkness and the demons will resist the angel who's carrying the answer to the Christian. My God. Now listen to this. He said... The armor is to protect your exploits. The demon and the agents would see if the angel has no helmet. So if the angel doesn't have the helmet of salvation on in the spirit, they could see the angel. 
because these are people walking in the Spirit. Uh, if they saw the angel didn't have a helmet of salvation on, then they would attack him at his head. If he didn't have the breastplate on, then they would know the Christian that that angel was assigned to didn't have the breastplate on. So guess how they would attack that angel? They would shoot at his heart. And guess what they would do then by doing that? They would know the struggle that the Christian had by seeing the part of the angel that was exposed. So if they did, their angel they saw in the spirit didn't have a, a, a helmet, they knew that they were dealing with things, mental strongholds in their mind, lust, depression, rebellion. If they were offended and hurt, he knew they didn't have the breastplate of righteousness. So automatically by seeing the angel and what armor the angel didn't have on, he knew what area the Christian that that angel was assigned to was vulnerable in. Do you know what the satanic occult agent, the former one, you know what he said that they would attack? They would attack the answer that the angel was carrying. And when they would attack that angel, you don't think angels and demons war? You think this sounds like a fantasy? Read the Bible. Read the book of Revelation. There's, a, there's warfare in the book of Revelation in the heavenly realm. And he's talking about spiritual warfare. Now listen to what he says. He says they would attack the answer that the angel was carrying and they would try to take it from him. And guess what? He said those answers that were coming from God by that person's angel to bring to that person if they couldn't get to him because they had no breakthrough over them, the demons would attack that angel and take the answer from God and then take it to the witch doctors in the occult. Let me explain. If a Christian started praying for a baby they wanted to conceive, God, help me to get pregnant. I'm barren. Let me conceive. God hears it. If they got a breakthrough over their life, their angel, whether he's armed or not, makes the difference, brings the answer to them. The, an the angel could have that answer on the way. But if that angel is not protected with the armor of God, then it cannot fight off the demons who attack him momentarily. So guess what they do? They take the answer and take it to the occult world. So when somebody is barren and they go to a witch doctor to get pregnant. You ever heard of that happening? And then they get pregnant and so all of a sudden people start getting faith. Well, my God, the occult seems to have more power than God does because people are going to witch doctors and they're getting healed. People are going to witch doctors and they're getting their needs met. They're, getting, they're having a baby. They're... And the reality is the answer was for the Christian. All good things come from the Father. That's what the Bible says. So the angel's bringing it down. The Christian isn't armed with the armor of God, so neither is the angel. The demons take the answer, take it to the world of darkness, and then people go to the, darkness, the world of darkness and into witchcraft to get the answer that the Christian was trying to get from God. And it looks like that the power is coming from the world of darkness. But Satan's not a creator. So everything that people are getting, the power they get from the, we the world of witchcraft, the power that they try to access from the occult world is power that really belongs to the people of God. The enemy just stole it. Oh, I don't know about it. Why do you sing it then? Going down to the enemy's camp. I'm going to take back what he took from me. See, we, songs we sing, we don't even know what we're singing. 
It looks like the world of darkness is giving answers and answering prayer and helping people with problems that God isn't. But the problem was it came from God. The agents of darkness gave it to the occult and the person got the answer from the occult world thinking then the occult world's more powerful than God. And it all happened because of a bunch of prayerless, armorless Christians. Does anybody remember reading the Bible somewhere says that the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous? Could it be? That the wealth of the wicked belongs to us. It just was stolen before the answer ever came. (laughs) Could it be that things that the world of darkness is offering to people are answers that came from God that were stolen. My God, could it be? Have you ever noticed how that God's people seem to struggle and the wicked prosper? I think Job said that. He seemed disgusted because here he was a Christian and everything seemed to go wrong in his life. But here all these wicked people, they're living like the devil and everything seems to be going right. So the devil makes it cool, look glorified to be a sinner. Well, no. You never notice that God's people struggle and that the wicked seem to prosper. Really? Who do you think gave them that money? Who do you think gave them that baby they went to the witch doctor for? Who do you think gave him that healing? Satan can't create. He just steals from those who don't pray through to the end. And the real question is is this. Will you pray through to the end? Or are you going to give up on your answer? Because the agents of the occult are attacking your angel. If they attack your angel that is not in armor, then they can hold him captive. And if your angel is held captive, then you have no one to minister to you and protect you. Does not the Bible say He gives His angels to bear thee up lest you dash your foot against a stone? You want to know how you can tell when somebody's angel's held captive? When a Christian gets cancer or dies in a car wreck. What does the scripture say? Angels are ministering spirits sent forth from God to minister to the heirs of salvation. So if your angels held captive temporarily, then you are vulnerable to the attack from hell because you don't have an angel to protect you in the spirit realm. And that's when bad things happen to God's people. I'm giving you some revelation tonight. Hallelujah. Now, While the angel is temporarily browned, then you become a victim until other Christians begin to pray. And that angel that was temporarily bound gets some reinforcements and the angel gets free. But if the person doesn't pray through, then the enemy, here get this now, if the person doesn't pray through and that angel doesn't get freed, here's what happens. The enemy will send his own angel to replace yours that's bound. It's called an angel of light. And that's when deception comes through. False visions. False prophecies. And you become open to all kinds of attacks. T.W. Barnes, who was the known prophetic minister 
in the UPC years ago. He told a story one time. Uh, Brother Larry Smith told me this. That one time this man was, he knew this other brother who was a well-known minister. If I said his name, some of you would know who he was. He was a well-known minister in the apostolic movement. He was used in the gifts mightily, mightily. He said, but then something somewhere along the line, the next time he saw him, something changed. And T.W. Barnes said, I noticed he had a different angel working with him. His angel changed. <laughs> and he got into deception and started preaching false doctrine. Until you understand how to operate with the weapons of God, until you understand how to understand the relationship that angels have to us, and until you understand the purpose of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit doesn't run to and fro from us. The angel of God does that. The Holy Spirit is beside us and leads us and guides us. The Holy Spirit wakes you up in the night and tells you, pray now! And you say, no, I'm tired. I'll just pray when I get up. No, you need to pray now. Why? Because he knows what's happening in the spirit realm that you can't see with your natural eye. Sometimes the Holy Spirit, with, you need to fast for three days. You, oh, God, I, I, this ain't the right time for me. No, I need to wait till later. No, you, need, you don't know what's happening in the spirit. And what you need to do is obey the unction of the Holy Ghost even when your vision doesn't line up with what he's telling you. I'm here to reaffirm somebody's faith tonight to remind them there is enough grace and power in the Holy Spirit and the blood of Jesus and the name of Jesus for you to maintain your breakthrough. You don't have to live defeated. You don't have to live discouraged. You don't have to live downtrodden. You are victorious through Jesus Christ our Lord. You can walk in victory if you know what to look for. You overcome. We know what we're doing. We're overcoming by the word of testimony right now. I want to read you this. This is a article written by Jeanette Strauss from her book entitled The Courtroom of Heaven to the Throne of Grace. She says, after seven years of praying for our daughter Stacy's backslidden spiritual condition, my husband Bud and I had become discouraged and frustrated. She was born again Bible-believing Christian who had gradually faded away from her Christian values and her way of life. Even if a Christian is not walking with the Lord, they probably know what they're doing is wrong. They still may confess Jesus as their Savior, but they don't often attend church or read the Word because it literally convicts them of their sin. They move themselves out of the kingdom of light where Jesus is king into the kingdom of darkness where Satan rules and enslaves. This was the case with our daughter. We prayed every way we knew how to pray. We pleaded and decreed scripture to the Lord. We addressed the enemy. We commanded and demanded the re release of our daughter. We bound Satan in the name of Jesus. We claimed the blood of Jesus over her. We did this for years and years without any visible results. We felt like we were beating against the wind. We weren't prepared for the tests that would turn out to be for us. We thought we'd done most everything right in raising her, but at times we blamed her, ourselves for her backslidden state. We have found that this is in common in many Christian families. Parents have done their best to raise the child properly, but the child chooses to go the way of the world. We know that children have to find their own way, which can be a heart-rending time for the parents. For Stacy's sake, we wish it wouldn't have happened, but the Lord was faithful to her. He brought her back as he promised us in his word he would do. He will be faithful in your situation too. One night while we were praying for her out of frustration and some fear, I admit, we asked the Lord for a new strategy for to pray for her. I think the Lord was waiting for that prayer because he answered it that very night, and this is the account of the dream that followed in the prayer. In the dream... Stacy, my daughter, and I were standing in a long, wide hallway. 
She asked me if I would help her, and I told her I would, and asked what she needed. She pointed to a door in the hallway and asked if I would go in and get the things that were in the room. She said she couldn't go into the room because someone was watching the room, and if they saw her, they would catch her and kill her. I walked over to the door, opened it.